Hi, I'm Michelle Hickner. I'm here to talk to you about a new paper we have in the AIAA journal. It's about data-driven unsteady aeroelastic modeling for control. So big picture, we're going to take some data where we predict coefficient of lift and some measure of deformation of a wing. It's going to be a flexible wing. We're going to turn that into a nice interpretable model that's also low rank and linear, so it's good for control. And then we're going to go over some control examples. So the reason that I care about models like this is because I'm really interested in insect flight or flight for robots that are kind of insect scale. And as you can see with this butterfly, it's got significant wing deformation. So we can't just use a rigid model and expect it to work. And also, especially for those robots, we might really care about how much deformation we're getting so that we can limit it. Also, at these scales, we start to care about viscosity. And so some of our classical models need to be adjusted a little bit. So let's talk about classical models. So this is thin airfoil theory, the very most basic version. We've got an angle of attack, so that's how much the wing or the plate is pitching against the flow. And then our coefficient of lift is a nice non-dimensional way of talking about how much lift force we're getting. So thin airfoil theory says, OK, in our, its most basic form, 2 pi times the angle of attack is how much is the coefficient of lift. That's lovely. It's obviously a little bit too simple for most cases. So let's move on to Theodorsen's model. So this is a model developed in the 1930s. It's again predicting coefficient of lift. And we still have our nice little 2 pi lift slope. It's still in there. Now that slope is being adjusted for the pitch point. That's what A is in this equation. Are you pitching from the leading edge? Are you pitching from the quarter chord? And that term associated with the 2 pi lift slope is still the quasi-steady term. But now we get some extra terms. Now we get some added mass terms. And those are associated with the angular velocity and angular acceleration of those pitching motions. So when a structure moves through a fluid, especially when it accelerates through a fluid, it can bring some of the fluid with it. And that's added mass that you have to account for when you think about the forces on the wing. And then we have this mysterious C of k term. So that's Theodorsen's transfer function. It's a whole mess of Bessel functions. I'm not going to show them to you. That's capturing the wake vorticity. So this model is for a sinusoidally pitching wing, nice harmonic motion. That k is reduced frequency. It's capturing the frequency at which the wing is pitching. And c of k will tell you how much the lift is attenuated or enhanced based on that flapping frequency in the wake vorticity. This model is great, but it does have some limitations. Uh, in particular, that 2 pi lift slope is really associated with inviscid flow. And as I mentioned, with insects, we care somewhat about viscous flow or about insect scale robots. It's also for that sinusoidally pitching with the idealized planar wake. But we want to know what's going to happen when you do arbitrary motions, not just sinusoidal motions. Also, we really do have flexible wings. And there's only a certain amount you can do with this model when it, as your wings get more and more flexible. So I keep talking about viscosity. Why do I keep talking about viscosity? So this is Reynolds' number down on this axis. And it's capturing something approximating to how much do you care about viscosity. And for big and fast things, viscosity might not matter. So that whale might not matter so much. But as you get into the insect scales and smaller, or into the insect robot scales, you do start to care about viscosity. That's what this Reynolds' number axis is capturing. So here's the model. It's a lot of terms. Let's go through them one by one. So we're predicting coefficient of lift and curvature. So the curvature here is our model, our way of measuring deformation. But it could also be strain or some sort of angle, whatever works best for your system. And we have some nice interpretable coefficients in here. And we're going to talk about how we get those. Let's go through them one by one. That orange term, that your, that's your quasi-steady term. The Upper line associated with coefficient of lift for it, that would be your 2 pi lift slope in a relatively inviscid regime. But as you get towards a viscous, viscous regime, that coefficient is going to change. And because we get this from data, we're going to be able to dial that associated with our system. And then our added mass terms, similarly, we've got these coefficients associated with 
angular acceleration and angular velocity. And they're also going to be adjusted for that viscous regime because we're going to get data from our system to build them. And this whole matrix has two rows, so you're going to get coefficients associated with the coefficient of lift. And then you're also going to get these coefficients associated with your measure of deformation. So you can see how much each term contributes to each. Our Theodorsen's transfer function is still brought in here. It's no longer explicitly a bunch of Bessel functions. That's your wake vorticity, and now it's also going to be your bending transients because we're also modeling deformation, not just coefficient of lift. So that's our C matrix there. So how do we get these? It's actually a great, nice, straightforward procedure, addition, multiplication. There's no hidden deep neural net hiding in here because we want not just the model to be interpretable, but also how you get there. So the first thing we do is we pluck off the added mass terms. On the bottom, we've got the maneuver we do in order to build this model. So we do a little short pitch up in angle of attack, and that's the equivalent of a nice little impulse in angular velocity, and then you also got these nice little peaks in angular acceleration. So you have clear peaks in those. At the top, we've got the coefficient of lift and the curvature data associated with this maneuver. So we do the maneuver, we take a time series data, and that's how we're going to build our model. So, oops, wrong direction. There we go. That peak in angular acceleration you see circled in purple. That's the point of maximum acceleration, so we want to get our coefficient associated with acceleration from there. We're going to grab the data from those two points at coefficient of lift and curvature, and that's how we're going to get that coefficient. We can do the same thing with angular velocity, take the peak angular velocity, and at the time series, the point where we're there, we're going to grab those points, and those are going to be turned into our angular velocity coefficient. So those are our two added mass coefficients, and we pull them from the times of maximum acceleration and maximum velocity. Those orange arrows over there, those are telling you that if you go to the very end of the time series, when everything's settled down, no more wibbly wobblies, that's where we're going to get our quasi-steady coefficient, which makes sense because we need it to be quasi-steady. If I showed you the data from there, it would be very flat and boring because that's what we need for quasi-steady. And then, all the other stuff. So we are going to use ERA, Eigensystem Realization Algorithm, to get the A matrix, the B matrix, and the C matrix that captures all of the transients and the wake vorticity. So this is the bending, the shedding of vortices. If you aren't familiar with ERA, I recommend watching Steve Brunton's videos on ERA to catch up on that. And you can also get more details about the exact ways to build this model from our paper. So the next step, how do you choose your model rank? So those latent states x we had in our model, we have to choose how many of them we want. And we want as few as possible so that we can have nice, fast, real-time control. You need to be able to compute what's going to happen in the system as fast as it's happening. So we're going to go from a, if you were simulating a big CFD with millions of different nodes, now we want to go down to just a few. So in this model, we could choose from the Hinkle singular values, similar to how you choose singular value cutoffs, truncation in any other system. And you might choose somewhere, you know, in this range, because you're going to get diminishing returns as you add more, uh, more states from there. I also like to use a test maneuver. It lets me tell, it shows me not just what the error is with that, but also exactly what's going on. It helps me understand what's happening in the system a little bit better as I cut off states. So you see a little dotted black line. We've got coefficient of lift up here. We've got curvature down here. The dotted black line is essentially reality. It's our big full-scale model that we're comparing this to and that we built the data off of, but off of a different maneuver. Hiding in the back, it's easier to see in the deformation. You've got a dark red line, and it's very straight. It's capturing that very low rank behavior, so that's our rank four model. But it's really not capturing any of the bending. It doesn't seem to be capturing any of the wake vorticity. So we can tell that's not a good model for us. That blue line, so that's the rank six model, it's looking 
okay for coefficient of lift. And this is one reason it's really important to also have deformation in your model, is that you want to be able to realize, wow, I'm really missing some things if I stick with that state. And you can see that it's tracking this red line. It has maybe one bending mode or one vortex shedding mode, but it's really missing a slower mode over here. And so we're not quite there yet. And we get to rank eight. We're not perfectly tracking our full order model, but we're doing a pretty good job. We're doing close enough that, that our feedback control will easily be able to handle any remaining errors. Uh, and similarly in coefficient of lift, we're doing great. So rank eight, that's great. Nice accuracy. We're happy. This model is more than just accurate. Let's talk about how you interpret what comes out. So we gave it those interpretable coefficients. What do we do with them? So this is just looking at that same test maneuver. We pitch up, we hold, we pitch down. And that gives us a nice little bit of acceleration. It gives us some nice quasi-steady behavior. So that's why we use this test maneuver. But the test maneuver might be different in different situations. At the very top, we're just showing that same data you saw. It's tracking it really nicely. This is actually a rank 9 model rather than an 8. But it's still doing, it's doing great. Here's the fun part. OK, so we've got coefficient of lift over here. We've got curvature over there. And now I've taken this upper curve and I've cracked it apart into each of, the each of the contributions from the angle of attack, the angular velocity, the angular acceleration, and the remaining transients and bending in that C matrix. So in coefficient of lift, what all of these curves are kind of similar sizes. That tells me that all of these contributions matter. In deformation, I think we get really interesting results. So in deformation, that kind of speed bump looking curve, that's tracking our angle of attack. That's the contribution to deformation from the angle of attack. No angular velocity, no angular acceleration. And it is very important. And then the second most important is that green curve. That's our bending modes and our transients. And we'd expect that from deformation, that our bending modes are important. But that's going to give us information when we design our control objectives that our deformation is really going to track our angle of attack. It doesn't care so much about acceleration, which wasn't intuitive to me. I might have expected that our deformation would really move around as I jerk this thing around. But no, it really tracks angle of attack mostly. So let's see how we can use this. I'm going to give you some control examples. This is just kind of our basic control architecture. We're going to be running a full order model. So this is our full order system, all of the nonlinearities. But we're going to do all of the prediction for the feedback using our linear rank 9 model, so our linear state space low rank model. We're using model predictive control. That's what's in this purple box. Because we wanted to be able to use constraints on curvature so it wouldn't bend too far. We're actually going to try this out with both constraints and references on curvature. And then we give a reference coefficient of lift. So we want it to track a certain coefficient of lift. And we use the cost function to say, how much do we care about one versus the other? So here's an example. In this one, we are not giving any weight to curvature. We're only giving a weight to lift. We only care about the lift. So that light gray in the background, that's our reference. The coefficient of lift is supposed to be tracking it. And what a beautiful job it does. That's great. But our curvature is going to take a long time to kind of swing down. And Lots of vibrations in your system definitely lower your service life. OK, so now we've added a green curve to that same plot we saw before. So we've added a reference curvature. We're saying, curvature, go to 0 after we're done with our little maneuver. We've given it a trade-off saying, I care about curvature sum, and I care about lift sum. And now we do see our lift tracking is a little bit worse. We had to give up something. But our curvature tracking, we managed to quash those vibrations much faster, which, if you're looking to extend service life, might be worth the trade-off in a little bit bumpier lift. Having the model be interpretable helps us avoid bad situations like this yellow curve and this red curve. So this is a similar test maneuver. This is a pitch up, hold, pitch down. But we've done it at a couple different speeds to capture how much of the quasi-steady contribution we're getting. So if you go too fast, your coefficient of lift simply can't track the reference. So this light gray is our reference. 
You can look at that first sharp curve, the yellow curve, just can't quite make it there. Okay, that's a pretty normal situation. If you go a little slower, this orange curve, oh, beautiful. It tracks it. But we've put in a, a constraint on the curvature. We've said don't bend too much at the leading edge because we don't want too much stress there. Maybe our plate could break or a wing could break. And so if you put a constraint on curvature and increase the angle of attack, so down here I've showed the angle of attack necessary to achieve this. So the longer you want to hold your higher coefficient of lift, the more your angle of attack has to increase. Because it's short maneuvers, it's really relying on angular acceleration. That's the added mass effect. But the longer you hold it, the longer it has to pitch further and further up. And as we saw from our interpretal coefficients, the deformation is really going to track that angle of attack. So you want to be able to do control objectives that you can get away with mostly with accelerate using angular acceleration and not just hold your wing at higher angles of attack. These were nice test maneuvers to demonstrate that, but sometimes systems are much trickier than that. And so having interpretable coefficients, being able to just look at a matrix and say, oh, this number is big, that means that I'm going to have to be able to avoid this situation makes planning your controls so much faster. There's so much less sorting out what's going on with the physics. So let's sum up what we've talked about. We talked about a method to make a linear low rank model. It's for an aeroelastic system with a flexible wing. And it's nice and quick for control. It accurately predicts lift and deformation. And the reason it's accurate is because we're getting it from data. So you can check out all the details in our paper here. And thank you for listening.